In this module, we will explore therapeutic communications and related principles of how to communicate with patients in a manner that achieves a positive relationship. Once completed with this module, you should be able to identify strategies for developing rapport with a patient, identify internal and external factors that affect a patient interview, describe effective patient interview techniques and interactions, discuss strategies for interviewing difficult patients who are not motivated to talk, and define unique interviewing techniques for patients with special needs. EMS providers deal with people in all sorts of situations. Some are low acuity, while others are horrifically tragic. Many will fall somewhere in between those two extremes. As a paramedic, you will be called upon to help people on what will arguably be the worst day of their lives. Some patients may not want your help. Others may lack the capacity to understand what is happening may speak a different language, making it difficult to communicate, or they may have very different cultural traditions and belief systems from that of the paramedic. Patients may be kind, apologetic, pleasant, helpful, intoxicated, altered, rude, mean, downright hostile, or who knows what. You will also need to deal with friends, family members, bystanders, and others on the scene who may or may not help or complicate your interactions with the patient. Regardless of what you experience on a scene, it will be your job to do everything within your power to provide high-quality care to your patient. This begins by developing rapport with the patient. You want the patient to feel comfortable with you and to trust you, at least as much as a person can trust someone they just met. That is the crux of therapeutic communications. As defined by numerous sources, therapeutic communication is the face-to-face -face process of interacting that focuses on advancing the physical and emotional well-being of a patient. As a paramedic, these interactions should be designed to help you collect information from the patient to determine illness while also providing a certain amount of health education depending upon the circumstances. Start the interaction by introducing yourself at the start of any conversation with the patient while making and maintaining eye contact with the patient. If possible, you do not want to hover over the patient, which can be intimidating. Rather, try to position yourself at the same level or lower. Also refer to the patient by his or her proper name unless the patient directs to otherwise. Do not assume that Jonathan is okay with being called John or Patricia does not have an issue with being called Pat or Patty. While you may have extensive training and education in medical terminology, the odds are that your patient will not share that same level of knowledge. Therefore, speak plainly without using medical jargon or complicated terminology. Keep things simple for your patient. Nonverbal communications are important in all of your interactions with patients, so be aware of your body language. Remember that this event, while it may be somewhat routine for you, may be very significant for your patient. Body language that makes you appear bored, indifferent, annoyed, angry, or in an otherwise negative light should be avoided as your nonverbal appearance can indeed undermine your verbal attempts to build rapport with the patient. There is an expression that it is not just what you say but how you say it. Sarcasm, cynicism, disdain, contempt, judgment, or making light of the patient's circumstances or complaints have no place in therapeutic communications with your patient. Your patient may be emotionally stressed given their particular situation, making it difficult to think clearly and logically. This makes it even more important that you speak calmly, slowly, and distinctly. You are the proverbial calm in the center of the patient's storm. You must act and speak in a calm, confident manner. If working with a patient who has hearing difficulties, not only must you speak clearly, but you should face your patient when talking and do not cover your lips. Lastly, be considerate of the patient. If you ask an open-ended question, which we'll describe in greater detail in a little bit, be prepared to allow the patient to answer. Do not cut the patient off when he or she is answering your questions. Unless time is critical, be patient and give the patient time to answer your questions. As alluded to earlier, paramedics cannot choose their patients, and some of these patients will fall into what are known as special populations, which can create some challenges in communication for the paramedic. You must be prepared to accommodate patients who are hearing impaired, do not speak English or have limited English skills, or lack capacity, such as a young child or a geriatric patient suffering from cognitive decline. If you are lucky, you may have access to an interpreter, which could mean more than someone to translate from one language to another. It could also be a parent helping you communicate with a child, or an adult offspring assisting with a geriatric patient. 
Another routine practice that can be distracting for a patient and undermine attempts to develop rapport is when the EMS provider is paying more attention to his or her notes than the patient. Maybe you have experienced something similar when seeing your personal physician or an intake nurse where they may be asking you questions, but they are not talking to you, they are talking to a computer screen. It can be hard to connect with a person who refuses to look at you during the patient interview because they are focused on completing the proverbial paperwork. Do not be one of those healthcare providers. Give your patient the attention and respect he or she deserves. Now, there is nothing wrong with taking notes, but it should not distract you from paying attention to your patient. You may even want to tell your patient that you are taking notes so that you do not miss or forget anything they are telling you. Most patients should understand that and be tolerant, if not appreciative, of the practice and your desire to ensure the information they are sharing is indeed captured correctly and appropriately. If your crew has enough people, you can have someone dedicated to documentation. That is often a rare luxury for EMS providers, however. It can be challenging, but you must be able to communicate effectively with your patient while also ensuring you are able to document the call adequately and correctly. As a paramedic practicing in the field, you will find that there are many factors outside of your control that can impact your ability to communicate effectively with a patient. With that being said, there are also internal factors over which you have total control. The first is that, as a paramedic, you must be accepting of others as unique individuals with their own beliefs, ideologies, values, dreams, fears, mannerisms, and stories. You are not there to judge, no matter how different someone's lifestyle is from yours. Your job is to help anyone who needs it. Is your patient under arrest for a violent crime against an innocent victim and he or she needs medical attention due to resisting arrest? That doesn't matter. It is the job of the courts to determine guilt and punishment. It is your job as a paramedic to provide high-quality medical care. Has a person indicated he or she has a problem with you because of your gender, race, tattoos, or something else? Again, your job is not to be an advocate for equal rights and social justice unless, of course, your patient would benefit from your advocacy in respect to those issues. Your job is to provide the best emergency medical care possible. Related to accepting people is the ability to demonstrate empathy. So what does it mean to be empathetic? While definitions can vary slightly, a comprehensive definition from Merriam-Webster states that empathy is the action of or capacity for understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another of either the past or present without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. Essentially, an empathetic paramedic can view the patient's experience through the lens of a patient him or herself. This is not to be confused with being sympathetic. Being sympathetic implies sharing or having the capacity to share the feelings of another. Empathy does not require the person to share those feelings. Rather, it is enough for the paramedic to be able to understand how the patient is feeling even if the paramedic does not or cannot feel the same way. To go a step further, some may wonder if empathy and compassion are the same thing or if being compassionate is required for therapeutic communications. Relying again on Merriam-Webster, the major difference between empathy and compassion is that empathy merely refers to the understanding of someone's pain. Compassion requires both an understanding of that pain along with a desire to eliminate, fix, or mitigate that pain. For the time being, the impact of sympathy or compassion on effective communications is not as clear as the impact empathy can have, so we will stop there with our exploration of empathy versus sympathy or compassion. As alluded to earlier, it is critical for the paramedic to be a good listener. Not only must you understand what the patient is trying to tell you, but you must be able to read between the proverbial lines and know when it is necessary to follow up on a question or response, when to push for more information, or when to take a different tact or cease a certain line of discussion or questioning given the patient's responses, body language, and other cues. Lastly, start the interaction off on the right foot with proper introductions. In most instances, the patient will not know you before their call for help. Assuming the circumstances permit, be sure to introduce yourself to the patient along with the other members of your crew. Also provide the patient with an opportunity to introduce him or herself to you. As mentioned previously, find out what name the patient goes by and use that name throughout your interactions with the patient. There are also external factors that may or may not be within your ability to control that can impact the effectiveness of your communications with a patient. 
Privacy is a big consideration for patients. Interviewing a patient while in his or her house is arguably different than that same interview in the middle of a public place like a restaurant or shopping mall. Depending upon the nature of the call or the patient's pertinent history, you may need to garner some rather personal and potentially embarrassing information from the patient. If that patient is surrounded by strangers or maybe even family members, the patient may be reluctant to be completely forthcoming when answering your questions. Asking an adolescent girl if she may be pregnant while her parents are in the room may not elicit an honest answer from the underage female patient. Likewise, asking a patient about taking illegal substances while the police are standing over your shoulder may not be the best circumstances under which a patient will be forthcoming with important information that could potentially impact the care you provide. When possible, try to provide a reasonable amount of privacy for the patient when conducting an interview, especially if you need to discuss potentially sensitive or embarrassing topics. Another external factor that can complicate communications with a patient includes interruptions, typically by third parties. Ever ask an older male patient questions only to have his wife chime in constantly to either answer the questions for the patient or correct him if she doesn't agree with his response? The same could be asked about a parent who continues to interject when you are talking to their adolescent child. What about a response to a scene that may not necessarily be safe or is incredibly hectic? The patient will not be able to concentrate fully on your questions if he or she is concerned about his or her safety. Even law enforcement presence can create complications, especially when the patient is under arrest, is a suspect in a criminal investigation, may be a witness to an accident, or is the victim of a crime. If the police officer continues to interrupt your interactions with the patient to garner information for a criminal investigation, those interruptions can negatively impact your communications with the patient. When possible, try to isolate the patient from potential sources of interruptions or distraction to improve the quality of your communications with the patient. Believe it or not, the way you are dressed can even have an impact on how you are perceived by the patient and, therefore, how comfortable the patient is sharing information with you. Even a volunteer EMS provider should convey an impression of confidence and professionalism. If you show up in ripped up jeans and a t-shirt smelling like you just fell off the back of a truck, that could erect a barrier in the mind of the patient. This is one of the reasons why many EMS agencies have dress code requirements that could even include whether or not visible tattoos or piercings are permitted. Your EMS agency has the right to maintain a professional brand in the eyes of the public and its customers. Make sure you are dressed to fit the part of an EMS professional as some patients will develop a first impression of you at a glance. The physical environment in which the interview is occurring can impact the quality of your communication with the patient as well. Dim lighting, strobe lights, or too much lighting can be problematic for the patient depending upon the circumstances. Noises and outside interference can make it difficult to hear or be heard. Distracting equipment can also be problematic when trying to hold the patient's undivided attention. Imagine for a moment that you responded to help a patient who was injured in an industrial workplace accident and the environment in which you find the patient is dirty, hot, and loud with people still staffing their workstations and performing work functions all around the patient. Such an environment can definitely impact your communications with the patient for numerous reasons. Your distance from the patient can be problematic too. Being too far away from the patient can complicate communications, as can encroaching the patient's personal space and being too close to the patient when speaking. Most ambulances have a captain's chair that winds up behind the patient when the patient is sitting on the cot. Asking the patient questions from that position behind the patient can negatively impact communications. As mentioned earlier, being either above or below the patient can be problematic as well. Your goal is to try to be at an equal height with the patient so that your eyes are on the same level with each other. In some cases, you may not be able to control these external factors to improve the quality of your communications with the patient. If the opportunity presents itself, however, you should. With those internal and external factors in mind, you will need to actually speak with the patient at some point and garner information from him or her commonly through the use of questions and subsequent discussion. When conducting this interview, there are two types of questions that are typically used to elicit information. The first is an open-ended question that provides a patient with an opportunity to share whatever information he or she deems pertinent to your question. 
Asking someone, what is going on today? Or how are you feeling? Are some quick examples of open-ended questions. When he or she responds to those questions, the patient is able to share whatever information he or she deems pertinent. The patient may even wind up going off in different directions and may fail to answer the question at all. Therefore, you must also be an active listener and pull the information you need from the patient's responses. If the patient is not actually answering the question or providing information that is helpful, it will be up to you to redirect the patient or to seek additional clarification. The second type of question is a closed or direct question. These questions do not provide a great deal of latitude for the patient as they are asking for very specific information or they are directing the patient to provide one of several specific responses. Asking a patient for his or her date of birth is an example of such a question. Having a patient rate his or her pain on a 0 to 10 pain scale is another example of a closed or direct question. Anything that calls for a simple yes or no answer also falls into that category. Closed or direct questions are advantageous to the paramedic because they seek to obtain very specific information from the patient in a very efficient fashion. The shortfall of such questions, however, is that the paramedic must first know to ask the type of question and, even if the paramedic is asking all of the right questions, the patient may still not be providing enough information to help the paramedic develop a field impression. Sometimes you really just need the patient to tell you his or her proverbial story to help bring things into focus. Then again, there is nothing that prevents a paramedic from using both types of questions during an interview of a patient. The best EMS providers are able to use both open-ended and closed or direct questions to help them garner a full understanding of the patient's condition and complaints from which they can then develop a field impression and subsequent treatment plan. Regardless of what types of questions you are asking the patient at the moment, it is important to ask the patient only one question at a time and allow the patient to answer the question before moving on. Also keep in mind the cognitive level of the patient and speak plainly in words, phrases, sentences, and questions that the patient will or can understand. Most members of the lay public have very little, if any, medical knowledge, and it is important to ensure the patient understands your questions so that he or she can provide correct and appropriate answers. As an example, which of the following do you think would be a more appropriate question for a patient? When did the near syncopal episode begin? Or, when did you start feeling like you were going to pass out? Arguably, the second question is the better one, as an average person with no medical training, education, or experience would probably struggle with trying to figure out what syncopal means. Use clear, plain language in your therapeutic communications with patients to increase the likelihood of a successful interaction. Unfortunately, not all of your patient interactions will be simple or easy. Sometimes your patient will be anxious, confused, belligerent, angry, or otherwise unhelpful. As a paramedic, there are several types of responses you could have to those patients when communication seems challenging. The first is to take on the role of a facilitator by trying to encourage the patient to provide information. Encourage the patient and utilize some open-ended questions or statements such as, could you explain that, or please tell me more. Sometimes your patient simply needs some time to sort out his or her thoughts. It was mentioned previously that you should not interrupt your patient and, even if the patient has not said anything yet, dwelling in that silent moment can give the patient enough time to formulate an answer to a question or to think about what he or she wants to say. Be patient and give the patient an opportunity to talk. Besides, many people find silence to be uncomfortable. The silence may very well be encouragement enough for the patient to provide some information for you. Reflection is a technique by which you repeat some of the patient's own words while also encouraging the patient to provide additional detail. As an example, a patient may have stated that her chest hurt. Employing a reflection technique, the paramedic may then say, So you're experiencing chest pain. That simple reflective prompt may be enough for the patient to then elaborate on what she is experiencing. If not, the paramedic can always ask a follow-up question, such as, can you describe the pain? We talked about empathy previously in this presentation, and demonstrating empathy can be a technique that a paramedic uses to elicit information from a patient. Let the patient know that you understand not only what he or she is saying, but what he or she may be feeling as well. Put yourself in the shoes of the patient, so to speak, and communicate with the patient as though you may be experiencing the same thing, keeping in mind how you would be thinking or feeling if the same situation occurred to you. 
If your patient provides information that makes no sense or you are unable to understand the patient or what he or she is trying to tell you, ask for clarification. Simply tell the patient that you need some more information or some clarification to understand what he or she is trying to tell you. This ties into the next technique as well, interpretation. Before asking for clarification, restate to the patient what you think he or she is trying to tell you. This is more than just a simple restatement of what the patient said, however. Rather than using the reflection technique, you will add your own interpretation of what the patient said and how you understand the situation. You can then ask the patient for either confirmation of your interpretation or for a correction. You may even begin that part of the conversation by saying, If I understand correctly, I think this is what you are saying. Then give the patient an opportunity to confirm, correct you, or provide additional information. Confrontation is a technique that may or may not be effective given the circumstances and the patient. Essentially, if something is not making sense and the information being provided by the patient is inconsistent or seems out of place, you may wish to politely, professionally, and non-judgmentally point the inconsistency out to the patient and then either ask a question of the patient to clarify the information or provide the patient with a moment of silence to see if he or she feels like saying something that may help. Again, depending on the circumstances, this technique could potentially annoy, aggravate, upset, or infuriate the patient. You do not want to convey an impression that you do not believe the patient or that the patient is outright lying to you, but if the story is not correlating with what you are finding during your assessment, those differences must be addressed. Another tact you can take is to process the information you have gathered thus far and explain what you are thinking to the patient based upon all of the information up to this point. Help the patient connect the dots between his or her symptoms, potential underlying causes, and what you are thinking may be the next most reasonable interventions to take. By helping the patient pull together the information while providing an explanation as to what this information may mean, that may coax some additional thoughts or information from the patient. Some patients will simply have trouble staying on topic. Whether an intentional attempt to misdirect you from a particular line of questioning or simply a result of how that person communicates, it may be necessary for you to redirect the patient when not answering your questions. Politely re-ask or rephrase the question for the patient and try to bring him or her back to the subject or topic at hand. For some patients, you may need to redirect them frequently. Lastly, summarizing information you have thus far in simple terms can help prompt additional information from the patient. Include what steps you are considering as well. Maybe there is a piece of data you are missing or something the patient shared that you did not quite hear or understand. Summarizing the information you have thus far can be helpful in many occasions. When conducting your patient interviews, there are some traps or techniques that can actually undermine the effectiveness of that communication. First, as much as you may want to tell the patient that everything will be okay, you should never convey a false assurance or reassurance. The same goes with speaking to friends or family members of the patient. Telling someone the patient will be just fine when indeed that is not the most likely outcome can raise questions as to the care you provided. After all, if you said the patient was going to be just fine but he or she died, the patient's survivors may find themselves wondering what went wrong or, worse yet, who made a mistake that resulted in a death. There are also ethical considerations related to knowingly providing false information. True, you want to help the patient remain optimistic and not lose the will to do everything he or she can to hang on, but lying to the patient or instilling false hope is not acceptable. Somewhat related to not providing false assurance or reassurance are situations in which the likelihood of a positive outcome for your patient is very low. Avoiding the patient's direct questions about their circumstances and potential outcome can also be a problem that undermines therapeutic communications. While there may be ways to spin the information or your thoughts for the benefit of the patient, you must still be open and honest with the patient. Delivering bad news is one of those unpleasant parts of the job. As a paramedic, you must be prepared to share some difficult truths with your patients when the need arises and the circumstances warrant. Along those lines, trying to emotionally distance yourself from the patient may be helpful for your own psychological well-being, but you must always be wary of doing so to the extent that you are no longer empathetic to your patients. If the patient senses that you are disconnected, he or she may attribute that to a lack of care or compassion on your part, which can impede therapeutic communications between the two of you. 
giving advice can be a problem in some situations, especially if the patient relies upon that advice to his or her detriment. Your patients will typically have the capacity to make their own health care decisions. You are not there to make decisions for them. Ultimately, you want to provide all the information you can to help the patient make complicated health care decisions. In doing so, you must also recognize the limits of your own knowledge, experience, and access to information. This can be a fine line as many patients will look at you as the trained paramedic for guidance on what they should do. Consider for a moment a scenario involving a female patient in her early 60s with chest discomfort. She ate some spicy food earlier in the evening and called you at 1 o'clock in the morning because she is having chest discomfort that woke her up. She thinks it may just be acid reflux or indigestion, but her husband called 911 anyway. She has shared that she is concerned about medical bills because they do not have adequate insurance and she does not want to go to the hospital for them to give her some overpriced over-the-counter drug for heartburn. She then looks at you and asks what she should do. How do you answer? Maybe your 12 lead does not show any acute changes and her chest discomfort seems to ebb and tide. Then again, maybe her signs and symptoms could lead you down several paths and more diagnosis is necessary. You want the patient to make the best decision for her health and well-being. The last thing you want is to tell the patient what he or she should do, only to have the patient take your advice and wind up suffering some type of harm because you were wrong. Additionally, providing unsolicited advice can make many people defensive as it can sound like you are lecturing or badgering the patient. Assist your patient, provide information, and try to help him or her make a good decision. Sometimes it can be tempting to assert authority that you do not have, especially when dealing with a patient who is having trouble making a decision regarding whether to go to the hospital or not, or with a patient who refuses treatment or transport despite clear evidence that such refusal is a horrible idea. Trying to exert authority to force or convince the patient to do one thing or another is ethically questionable and can undermine effective communications with the patient. It was mentioned a few times before, but bears repeating here, avoid the use of complicated medical terms and professional jargon when interviewing a patient. Keep things clear and simple. Assume your patient has no medical training or knowledge. Even if the patient does have medical training or knowledge, speaking in jargon or technical terms could still be problematic if you say something the patient does not understand or vice versa, and the patient or you fails to obtain clarification, or if the patient has a different definition or understanding of a certain term of art than you do. Again, speaking in clear, simple terms is the best way to avoid misunderstandings while also facilitating therapeutic communications with the patient. When asking questions of the patient, try to avoid leading questions of the patient. These types of questions may start the patient's thinking down a specific path that may not necessarily be pertinent or appropriate, yet they are in the patient's mind and can then taint the quality of the responses. As an example of the impact of suggestion and leading questions, take a moment to clear your mind. Now, whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant. Did you think of a pink elephant even though you were told not to? Probably. Leading questions can have a somewhat similar impact on a patient interview. Use open-ended questions without providing a possible conclusion within the question itself. Allow the patient to describe things in his or her own terms. We also talked about the value of silence and the propensity to try and fill voids in conversation. Beyond those awkward silences, paramedics must also be wary of talking too much. Remember, you are there for the patient, not vice versa. The patient did not call 911 to hear you talk. Besides, the more you are talking, the less time you have for listening. Do not talk over the patient or dominate the discussion with your own musings and thoughts. Allow the patient plenty of time to talk and share with you. This also means avoiding interruptions. Do not interrupt the patient if you can help it. While there are times when you may need to redirect a patient and bring him or her back to a particular question or topic, for the most part you should avoid interrupting the patient when he or she is talking. Lastly, avoid using why questions with your patients. The reason is that why questions are often associated with accusations. Asking why someone did something or feels a particular way gives the implication that you inherently may disagree with their why, in effect making the patient feel judged. Remember, the purpose here is to utilize effective interview techniques to improve the quality of therapeutic communications with a patient. These particular practices, which may undermine those efforts, should be avoided. 
Again, you want to develop a rapport with your patient to improve the quality of your interactions with that patient and to obtain information that is necessary for you to provide high-quality health care. In trying to ascertain information from the patient, begin by recognizing there are multiple ways by which a patient can communicate with you. Verbal communication, such as talking, is the most common and easy to identify. Just as we mentioned previously that you must be aware of your body language when communicating with a patient, those patients will communicate non-verbally as well. Hand gestures, posturing, eye contact, nervous tics, and other mannerisms often convey meaning to astute communicators. These nonverbal communication clues are often subconscious or automatic on the part of the sender. In contrast, visual communication is a third means by which a patient may attempt to communicate with you, and such an attempt requires conscious thought and effort. Maybe the patient needs to write something, is pointing to draw your attention to something, or is hard of hearing, or does not speak English and is using intentional gestures to try and convey a message. Ultimately, the point is that patients may intentionally or unintentionally communicate with you in numerous ways and, as a paramedic, you must be aware of these various types of communication methods and attempt to accommodate them. If you are asking the patient questions and listening to responses while your attention is on a laptop or electronic device to record information for the PCR, you may be missing several important nonverbal clues or visual information that may prove just as important as the words the patient is speaking. In addition to recognizing that patients can communicate via different methods, not just verbally, the astute paramedic must also be aware that some patients may not be forthcoming when asked about certain complaints or sensitive topics. In such cases, the patient may resist the line of questioning or attempt to shift the paramedic's focus to another topic. Sometimes this misdirection will be intentional. In other cases, a line of questioning may prompt a somewhat visceral reaction by the patient in that his or her internal defenses to discussing such a topic will impact the patient's response without him or her even thinking about it. An internalized denial or being strongly offended by the subject matter, for example, could prompt such a response given an automated activation of the individual's psychological defense mechanisms. Remember as well that on-scene distractions, which could also include the patient's own emergent medical condition, can also make it difficult for a patient to think clearly or to contribute in a meaningful fashion to your questions. When communicating with your patient, be sure to observe the patient for those nonverbal cues. When conversing with the patient, the quality of that conversation can tell you a lot as well. Is the patient oriented to his or her person, place, time, and circumstances? What is the quality of the patient's speech? Is it clear and deliberate, or is it slurred and incoherent? Based upon the conversation, does the patient seem to be thinking logically? What about his or her attention span? Is the patient easily distracted, or does the patient seem listless during the conversation? What about his or her concentration? Does the patient seem to drift in and out of different topics when talking with you? Does the patient seem able to comprehend what you are saying or the surrounding circumstances? What about the patient's memory? Does the patient recall things that happened several years ago? What about events within the past few days or weeks? What about the very recent events within the past few hours or minutes? Gauging the patient's memory across remote, recent, and immediate time frames can be very helpful for a physician who needs to diagnose a patient with some type of related defect. People are also emotional beings, and an individual's affect is the expression of emotions or feelings displayed through facial expressions, hand gestures, tone of voice, and other nonverbal cues. Note the patient's affect when speaking with him or her. Watch for autonomic responses, which are involuntary responses to things such as stressors or the environment. What types of facial movements are present? Does a certain question or line of conversation seem to accompany reactive movements? Is the patient exhibiting unconscious grooming movements, such as using a hand to brush his or her back or constantly attempting to straighten his or her clothes? All of these various cues can tell you something about the patient and his or her condition if you are astute enough to notice them. It may be necessary for you as a paramedic to attempt to explore the patient's psyche further during the duration of your interaction to gauge the patient's mood, energy level, and content of thinking, as that data can further inform your process of conducting an effective interview while trying to build further rapport with the patient. As alluded to earlier, not all of your patients will be pleasant, forthcoming, or helpful. 
While most patients are more than willing to talk with a paramedic, especially if they are the ones who called for help, you will occasionally need to provide care to what may be described as a difficult patient. Unfortunately, some patients are downright mean, hostile, or violent. Maybe the person is intoxicated, under arrest, suffering from a psychological or behavioral issue, or simply does not want your help. Regardless of the reason, the hostile or violent patient can be a very real threat to you and others. Therefore, always keep scene safety in mind. Maintain eye contact. Try to conduct an interview with another crew member present. Keep an escape route available. Never allow the patient to be between you and the door if you can avoid it. And remain diligent for signs of a possible attack. If necessary, retreat from the scene and request law enforcement assistance, assuming the police are not there already. Just because you feel threatened or intimidated does not mean all bets are off, so to speak, as you must still provide patient care. Therefore, it is in the best interest of both you and the patient to try and build at least some semblance of rapport. Be open and honest with the patient. Do not judge. Treat the person with courtesy and respect. Stay calm and speak evenly with the patient. Do not make any sudden movements, especially toward the agitated patient. Also avoid escalating the situation through words or actions. Keep the patient informed of what you are doing and, if you need to touch the patient as a part of your assessment, ask for permission first. Do not simply rely upon implied consent. The last thing you want to do is trigger the person because he or she did not want to be touched. If you have a patient under the influence of alcohol or drugs, whether those substances are legal or illegal, your communication strategies may need to change to accommodate the patient and his or her resulting state. Some drugs can result in euphoria or feeling good. Others are depressants that may lower the patient's desire to engage in a conversation. Some may result in the patient being hostile as discussed previously, or maybe the patient will be docile. Generally speaking, you need to communicate with these patients openly and honestly without being judgmental or offensive. Keep an even tone in your voice and be deliberate in your movements. Be aware of possible abrupt mood changes and always keep your safety in mind. Some patients may be sexually aggressive toward you or others. This could be due to a brain injury, mental illness, or a complete lack of social graces and an understanding of societal norms. The patient may be male, female, transitioning, or questioning, and the aggression may be directed toward anyone regardless of gender. As with the hostile patient, you must still provide medical care to such a patient. We will discuss workplace harassment in a later module, and while you do have a right to a harassment-free work environment, the challenge in providing such an environment within an EMS context is that we cannot choose our patients and we must provide care to everyone who needs or requests it. Therefore, it is best to have strategies for mitigation of such scenarios in place before they occur. Given the sexual undertones and nature of the interaction, it is best to ensure that two people, yourself and another EMS provider, police officer, or healthcare worker, are with the patient at all times. Always maintain your professionalism. Be courteous and polite. If advances are made, rebuff them in clear, unambiguous terms and continue your assessment and treatment. Be sure to document the behavior and interaction thoroughly as well. Hearing impaired patients can be difficult to interview as most people communicate audibly and it can be unusual for a paramedic to have to switch his or her method of communication to accommodate the hearing impaired patient. If a family member or friend is present and can be used as a translator for the patient, that can be helpful. Be sure you are speaking to the patient, however. As mentioned before, speak clearly and deliberately. Do not hide or obscure your mouth. Hearing impaired does not necessarily mean the patient is completely deaf, and reading lips is just one mechanism some hearing impaired individuals use to assist them in communicating with others. Try to ask short questions and listen attentively. If necessary, utilize pen and paper so you can write questions and answers back and forth with the patient. Assuming the patient does not have visual disabilities, be sure to use body language, hand gestures, and visual aids and communication methods to assist you. If a patient is visually impaired, the challenge is obviously different. First of all, the level of that impairment can mean different things for different people. Maybe the patient is blind in one eye only, and therefore you should try to stay on one side of the patient in the visual field of his or her working eye. Maybe the patient can make out blurry shapes or loses visual acuity in dim light. Regardless, it is a best practice to use verbal communication to describe what you are doing and what the patient should expect to happen. 
Do not assume the patient can see you reaching in to take a blood pressure, for example. You must describe your actions verbally to the patient. If the patient has a service dog, make every effort to not separate the person from their dog, which will probably mean transporting the dog along with the patient. Language barriers can be challenging to overcome when providing emergency medicine in the field. Rarely will an EMS agency have access to an interpreter, and even if it does, there is no guarantee that the interpreter will speak the language of the patient. If there is a friend or family member present who can translate for the patient, that should prove to be helpful. Otherwise, you may find yourself relying on hand gestures, pantomimes, and pointing to assist in your communications. Luckily, technology now exists to assist with translation of words and phrases right on a smartphone, which is an aid that can be used by EMS providers in the field. It is not perfect, but it can be better than nothing. Simply speaking slower and louder is ineffective in addressing a language barrier, and the practice may actually undermine what limited rapport you have been able to generate with the patient. If you know you will be providing EMS in an area with a high percentage of people who speak a different language, it may actually be worth your while to learn some common phrases in that language so that you are prepared to communicate on at least a very cursory level when responding to people within that specific population. When contacting the hospital, be sure to notify them of the language barrier. Many hospitals have translators on staff or on call, and providing them with a heads-up can be very helpful in ensuring your patient receives quality care at the hospital without the language barrier being too great of a detriment. Interviewing children can be challenging depending on their age and whether or not their parents are present. Depending upon the age of the child, he or she may not be able to communicate effectively with you at all. Add in the facts that the child is not feeling well or is injured, you are probably a complete stranger to that child, some interventions like starting an IV can actually be painful, and your presence may result in them being further away from their parents than they are comfortable with, and the communication issues seem to compound exponentially. When dealing with children, try to approach them from eye level. Maintain a reassuring smile and a kind face. Try to involve the child's parents or caregivers in the interview. If the parent can actually hold the child during the interview, that may make a positive difference. Using props or stuffed animals can help with some children. On the flip side, some older children, adolescents in particular, may not want to have their parents participating in the interview process, especially if the assessment involves sensitive subjects such as sexual history, alcohol consumption, or drug use. As patients age, they do not always do so gracefully. Time can take its toll on the body and mind, and interviewing elderly patients can prove to be challenging in some circumstances. To begin, do not assume that a patient is senile or confused simply because he or she is older. Many elderly patients maintain their mental faculties well into their golden years, and a state of confusion or abnormal behavior may be signs of a serious medical emergency rather than the effects of old age. If an elderly patient has an altered mental status, try to find out from a friend, family member, or caregiver whether or not that mental status is normal for the patient. It is also common for people to not register pain in the same way or to the same extent as they reach an older age. You must rely upon a sound assessment to identify injuries or other problems of which the patient may not necessarily be aware. Visual or auditory deficiencies can be commonplace in the elderly population, so keep the tips we discussed previously for those populations in mind if your elderly patient suffers from either of those sensory ailments. There are also other populations with which you may come into contact where patient interviews will prove difficult. Such populations could include people who have suffered from a stroke or traumatic brain injury, pervasive developmental disorders, mental illness, or any combination of the factors we already discussed along with others. Your strategies for communicating with these individuals will need to vary based upon the circumstances and the needs of the individual patient. With that in mind, there are some techniques that, when applied broadly across these various populations, can often help with difficult interviews. First, you never know how an interview with a patient will be until that interview starts. Therefore, begin your patient interviews in a normal manner and adjust your interview technique as necessary depending on how things progress. Attempt to use open-ended questions and provide the patient with positive feedback when you can. It is important that you confirm the patient is understanding your questions and, if there appears to be any confusion or disconnect, continue to ask simple and concise questions to seek and obtain clarification. 
With those difficult interview scenarios in mind, let's take a moment to focus a little further on interview techniques based upon the age of the patient. Infants are still learning how to interact with their environment and will obviously not be able to communicate effectively with EMS personnel. Fear, pain, and the unknown can make these interactions even more complicated. Preschoolers may be a little bit better as their understanding of the world has developed considerably and they may even be able to communicate verbally in short phrases or full sentences depending upon their age and level of development. In these interactions, do what you can to minimize the child's anxiety. Approach the child from eye level. Involve the child's caregiver. Keep a pleasant expression and smile on your face. Minimize your movements, especially when close to the child, and do not be abrupt if you can avoid it. Talk to the child in a reassuring tone, and if the child can indeed understand some of your words, keep them simple and appropriate for his or her level of understanding. Using props or stuffed animals can help. Also, do not underestimate the importance of helping the child's parents remain calm as well. Younger children will often emulate the emotional responses of their parents or caregivers. If the child sees his or her parents upset, the child may be more prone to being upset too. Maintain a calm and professional demeanor with the child and his or her parents or caregivers. That can prove helpful. As children age and enter their school years, they typically have a much better, all but developing, understanding of the world around them. They are more aware of their own bodies and have an understanding of both truth and deception. Be open and honest with the child. Speak in terms and vocabulary that is age-appropriate. Provide them with clear explanations of what is going on and what you are doing. Respect their modesty and use their parents or caregivers to help you with the interview. Sometimes, if you provide the child with choices and ask questions that lend themselves to those choices, you can develop a certain level of rapport and trust with the child. Be wary of yes or no questions when you are seeking permission when using this tactic, however. If you ask the child permission to do something and he or she says no, you may still need to perform that skill or intervention despite the child's refusal, which will undermine the limited trust you have with that child. Rather, present the child with an option that meets your needs but still gives the child some say in what is happening. As an example, do not ask a child if it is okay if you take his or her blood pressure. Rather, ask the child if he or she would prefer that you take the blood pressure on the left or right arm. As children age into adolescence, their ability for comprehension increases significantly, their bodies go through puberty, they are much more aware of themselves and their bodies, peer pressure becomes more of an influencing factor on many of their decisions, and the need for parental intervention in routine matters is typically not as great. Through the high school years in particular, these children are rapidly approaching adulthood, yet they are often not afforded the same rights under the law as are enjoyed by adults, which means a parent or guardian is still responsible for making health care decisions for the adolescent patient. Depending upon the nature of the emergency or incident, the adolescent patient may have information he or she does not want to share with parents or other adults, such as the use of alcohol or drugs, or sexual activity. While you can probably speak to an adolescent as you would to an adult, you must be sensitive of the adolescent patient's surroundings during the interview. It may be necessary to separate him or her from parents or guardians. Depending upon the circumstances, a law enforcement presence may also hinder the interview. Treat the patient with respect, do not preach or judge, and try to obtain the patient's consent before procedures and interventions. We will discuss consent for minors in a later module, so we will not delve too deeply here, but remember that the adolescent patient more often than not lacks legal capacity to make his or her own health care decisions, which means that even if you are trying to involve the patient in determining the best options for care, it may ultimately be up to the patient's parents or guardians to determine the best course of action. Communicating with adults is a routine part of the job for a paramedic, and there are very few additional interviewing techniques to keep in mind that have not already been mentioned elsewhere in this presentation. Remember the importance of developing rapport with the patient, and if special circumstances present themselves, adjust your communication strategies accordingly to accommodate the situation at hand. Lastly, you will often have to interview older patients as well. Techniques for communicating with geriatric patients was already covered in this module, so there is no need to repeat that information here. Remember that there is no rule that limits the number of ailments from which a person may suffer. 
As we age, it is not unlikely for a person to experience the deterioration of numerous body systems and functions at the same time. In many cases, you may find that your geriatric patients suffer from both visual as well as auditory deficits, in addition to other ailments associated with advanced age. To assist in the interview process with these patients, offer to retrieve their glasses or hearing aids if they do not already have them. Using other techniques already discussed for various special circumstances or populations may prove helpful as well. Another group of patients that may be difficult to interview includes those with special challenges or needs. These patients can suffer from a wide assortment of circumstances and ailments, including victims of abuse or neglect, homelessness, severe poverty, bariatric, terminal illnesses, technology dependent, or those with a developmental disability. To begin, many patients with special challenges are probably accustomed to interacting with others who do not share their particular ailment or special needs. If caregivers are involved, they are typically also familiar with serving as an intermediary between the patient and others. If a particular condition is technical or complicated, the person or caregiver may have received some training or education on how to deal with complications associated with that particular life challenge. Therefore, relying upon the knowledge and experience of the patient or a caregiver with regard to a particular communication challenge can sometimes prove beneficial. As far as these various patients are concerned, we'll focus for a moment on those with developmental delays or disabilities, as those can present some unique and challenging communication issues. According to the CDC, a developmental disability can include any number of conditions that include physical, learning, language, or behavioral impairments. Many of these impairments manifest themselves early in life and continue throughout the individual's lifetime. When speaking about developmental delays, we are referring to cases where an infant or child fails to reach a particular developmental milestone within a reasonable or expected time frame. Such milestones would include the development of both gross and fine motor skills, cognitive skills, and social skills. Down syndrome, autism, and other adaptive mental or emotional impairments may manifest themselves and the ability to effectively talk, listen, comprehend, and communicate are often impacted. Recognize as well that each person may experience different degrees of disability or may find themselves at a particular stage of development that would not normally correlate with their physical age. Many of the tips provided earlier can prove helpful when communicating with patients suffering from these various challenges. Maintain a calm and pleasant demeanor. Try to be warm and friendly. Lower yourself to the patient's level and maintain eye contact. Speak clearly and deliberately. Be cautious about encroaching into the patient's personal space or prompting a negative reaction due to quick, sudden, or threatening movements. Many patients with autism do not like being touched, and doing so may trigger such patients, making further communication even more difficult. Some patients with developmental or other related disabilities may be able to communicate with you, others may lose some capacity as they experience stress, and some patients are unable to communicate effectively at all. If there is a caregiver present, be sure to involve the caregiver, ask for assistance on how best to communicate, and maintain an astute awareness of the patient and the surroundings to garner clues as to what communication techniques appear to work well or not at all. Another factor that often raises barriers to effective communication is cultural differences. As a paramedic, you will be exposed to different people from all walks of life. Even if you practice in a somewhat homogeneous community, there is still a high chance that you will be called upon to provide help and assistance to someone who is significantly different from you. There is even tremendous variation and diversity within a single broad culture. While diversity may mean different things to different people, race or ethnic origin are only two examples of how individual people are different from each other. Socioeconomic class or status age, gender, identity, sexual preference, personal habits, physical ability, criminal background, religious beliefs, family background, genetic variation, and military experience are just some quick examples of how we are all different from each other. Ultimately, while it may be the goal of the paramedic to treat everyone the same regardless of these various differences, there are times when providing good, high-quality, effective health care requires the paramedic to recognize and be sensitive to these differences. Everyone has their own story with regard to their personal health and previous or current illnesses, and those stories are often influenced by their personal and religious beliefs, routine behaviors, and past experiences, all of which are probably different from yours. 
By being empathetic and revealing an awareness of cultural issues, you can foster additional rapport with your patient by conveying interest, concern, and respect for him or her as an individual person. When interacting with diverse populations, remember that the individual is the foreground and the culture is the background. This means that while the individual's culture may have significant influence over who that person is, many people are not defined solely by their culture. Regardless of where the person came from, that person is still an individual with his or her own system of beliefs. A simple example of this would be the variations between people within a single family given their age and experiences along with the environment in which they live. Grandma may not embrace diversity and cannot understand the infatuation with social networking and electronic devices, while the grandson considers grandma old-fashioned and out of touch with the times. Along somewhat similar lines, not all people identify with their ethnic cultural background. Maybe a family immigrates into the United States and the parents are very grounded in the traditions and beliefs of their culture from their native country, yet their children were young when they moved and, over time, consider themselves native to America and do not identify with the homeland of their parents. Regardless of where we come from and the experiences that shape us, we are more alike than most realize. We all bleed red, so to speak. Regardless of those differences that often separate us, many of us strive for the same things, to live a happy, long, and fruitful life, to have meaningful relationships, to live their lives in harmony with others, to be treated fairly and with respect, and so on. Everyone has challenges in their lives and everyone experiences their fair share of problems, defeats, and bad days. When that person calls 911 for help, those differences that society is often so quick to focus upon really do not matter anymore. As a paramedic, you should respect the integrity of cultural beliefs while treating everyone with compassion and respect. Despite your best efforts, unintentional or unconscious biases can still play a part in interactions with others. That proverbial door also swings both ways in that your patients will also have their own personal biases and assumptions. As mentioned before, you will probably be a stranger to most of the people that you meet as a part of your duties. Trust is afforded to you by patients given the uniform you wear or your title as a paramedic. That does not mean, however, that the patient will be able to drop his or her personal beliefs or thoughts at the door, so to speak. Some patients may be very uncomfortable sharing their health background with you. Some may not accept certain treatments, interventions, or medications based upon cultural or religious beliefs. As a paramedic, you may not agree with the patient's cultural or religious beliefs, and the patient may not agree with yours, but that does not mean that you are therefore impeded from providing high-quality health care to the patient. It is okay for you to have your own cultural assumptions, prejudices, and belief systems. That is part of the human condition, and just because you are a paramedic does not mean you can turn off those parts of yourself while performing as a paramedic. The important thing, however, is to recognize those assumptions and prejudices and do not allow them to interfere with the care you provide. When working with diverse populations, begin the interaction as you typically would with any patient. Introduce yourself to the patient and let the patient know how you would like to be addressed. Ask the same of your patient. Use this introduction as the basis for developing rapport with the patient. Again, both you as a paramedic as well as your patient will bring cultural stereotypes to the paramedic-patient relationship. We are all ethnocentric, which means we see the world through our own eyes and experiences. If you have never lived in poverty, have never been fearful of others based upon your gender, do not know how it feels to be unemployed because of the color of your skin, have not had to tolerate jokes that marginalize your sexual identity or preferences, or have only experienced life in one type of environment, the lack of those negative experiences will also impact your sense of what is normal. It is easy to think that everyone's experiences are like your own because you simply do not know better. Often this can translate into a willful blindness of sorts where the filters on our perception can actually help us avoid seeing things that are uncomfortable for us or realities that are foreign or outside of our comfort zone. This can also lead to what is known as cultural imposition where we simply assume that our thoughts and beliefs are common or are the right ones and therefore everyone must think the same way or adopt the same belief system. Remember that just because something is normal for you does not mean it is normal for everyone else. Again, be culturally sensitive and seek to understand others without assuming that your way of seeing things is the way in which everyone else sees the same things. 
As some examples of common cultural differences and how they can impact the care you provide, let's begin by looking at the topic of personal space. People are culturally trained from a young age to respect certain boundaries as far as personal space is concerned. There is a distance at which it is acceptable for a significant other, a family member, or a close friend to encroach. This is referred to as an intimate zone. We also maintain a routine distance with others and recognize that a given amount of open or free space is preferred. There is a different range for social interactions, and we want complete strangers to be even further away from us. Ever go to an assembly occupancy like a theater or church and recognize how people choose to sit? Oftentimes they are very spread out if given the opportunity. They will sit by family and friends but prefer space from others. What makes this concept of personal space interesting and why it comes up in our discussion here is because this idea of personal space varies given cultural norms. In 2017, the Washington Post published an article on personal space and how cultural norms impact what is typically considered acceptable. First, the study recognized a difference in what type of space is acceptable given the nature of the relationship between the two people. The existence of a close relationship, the intimate zone previously mentioned, allows people to be closer together than if they were simply personal acquaintances. If the person was a stranger, that distance increased significantly. To compare and contrast, the average intimate distance within the United States was noted as 1.6 feet. Strangers should respect a distance of about 3.1 feet. In Romania, the intimate distance was the same, but the stranger was expected to be 4.6 feet away. In Saudi Arabia, the personal distance was actually further away than what many in the United States require for strangers at 3.2 feet. The point is that cultural differences play a significant factor in our personal interactions, and one of the first elements at play is completely nonverbal, the distance between two people. To complicate things, the distance considered acceptable varies not only by culture, but by the nature of the relationship. A compounding factor is the way in which different cultures handle the prospect of simply being sick. Some cultures with densely populated areas tend to recognize a greater responsibility to others than commonly seen in the United States, which may prompt individuals from those cultures to isolate themselves from others when they are sick or to wear face masks to avoid spreading an illness. Depending upon the nature of the illness, the person may be embarrassed or ashamed and, as a result, is less likely to share information about the ailment. Moving beyond the concept of personal space, nonverbal communications are often perceived differently by people from different cultures. Standing with your hands on your hips may show impatience or annoyance in many areas of the United States, while someone from Mexico or Argentina can actually consider that to be a sign of aggression. Nodding to an American commonly indicates agreement or consent, while the same gesture in some countries may merely indicate the person is acknowledging you without any assurance of agreement or consent. Assent in some cultures is actually indicated non-verbally by moving the head side to side, which in Western cultures would actually mean no. Eye contact is considered respectful within the United States, and a failure to meet someone's gaze can be interpreted as unfriendly, disengaged, distracted, uninterested, or rude. In other countries or cultures, maintaining eye contact is actually considered impolite or aggressive. Looking away can actually be a sign of deference or respect. Touch is also handled differently in many cultures. Some cultures consider a person's left hand to be unclean, and touching with the left hand is unacceptable or rude. Touching a person's head is offensive in some cultures. Even within Western cultures, some touching may be friendly or permissible, while other touching may be offensive, unwelcome, or even illegal, depending on the nature of the touch and the part of the body that was touched. Language barriers were already discussed previously, but bear to be mentioned again here. The inability to speak a common language can make things very difficult within a high-stakes environment where open and effective communication is important. EMS providers may often resort to commonly accepted hand gestures when trying to overcome a language barrier, but it is not without risks as some routine hand gestures in one culture can be offensive in others. Pointing, speaking in short, simple sentences, trying to use friends or family members of the patient to translate, using diagrams and illustrations, and even employing smartphones, Google Translate, and other electronic tools are all techniques for trying to communicate with someone who does not speak the same language.
Lastly, also recognize that there can be significant variations between cultures as to what is acceptable within the realms of privacy and modesty. Some cultures have different expectations for men and women, which other cultures may consider intolerant. A quick example is the wearing of a hijab by Muslim women, or a burqa or tikre by an Afghanistan woman. Some cultural religious beliefs can complicate an assessment given a belief that modesty must be maintained in the presence of strangers, even if the stranger is a paramedic. To reiterate, as a paramedic, you must be culturally aware and must make your best efforts to respect the culture, beliefs, and wishes of your patients. When working with diverse patients, remember that most of them will be anxious during an emergency event regardless of their cultural background, educational status, or ability to speak English. Your goal, regardless, will be to try and develop a rapport with the patient to foster effective therapeutic communication. Begin your introduction as you normally would. If the patient has difficulty understanding due to limited proficiency with English, see if you can gauge this deficiency. Does the patient understand some English, or does the patient lack the ability to speak or understand any English at all? Are there bystanders, co-workers, friends, or family members in the area that may be able to provide assistance? If not, you must still provide care to that patient and must make efforts to communicate, even if that means utilizing signs and gestures. If your agency has access to an interpreter, have that person respond. Be sure to also provide the transport destination facility with a heads up that an interpreter will be necessary. Regardless of the challenges you are experiencing given cultural differences between yourself and the patient, you should always attempt to obtain the patient's permission to perform an intervention. If you are having challenges communicating effectively with that patient, perform your procedures slowly and deliberately. This should give the patient an opportunity to object to the procedure before it is actually performed. Remember that personal or private space is culturally defined, and the individual patient may have different expectations as to the maintenance of that personal space than you do. The same goes for privacy and modesty expectations. Be sure to communicate with the patient before examining or touching the patient. If a language barrier makes that difficult, then be sure to point to the body area and proceed slowly before touching the patient for an examination. There was obviously a lot of information in this module. Because human interactions and communication can be so complicated, we arguably barely scratched the proverbial surface of how to best communicate effectively with the many various types of patients that you may encounter as a paramedic. Take this information along with your previous learning on the subject and personal experience to further develop your therapeutic communication skills. If you struggle with therapeutic communications or are desperate to learn more about the subject, you may even want to look into taking additional college coursework on the topic. For the time being, given your completion of this module, you should now be able to identify strategies for developing rapport with a patient, identify internal and external factors that can impact an interview, describe effective interviewing techniques and interactions, discuss strategies for interviewing difficult patients who are not motivated to talk, and define unique interviewing techniques for patients with special needs. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.